uh, Border Rock Boyer. You know, about probably about 10 years ago, um, I uh, started to share my work on, on social media. And um, I remember distinctly there were some people who were really like, you know, shocked by the fact that I, I was openly describing, you, you know, my 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 work, right? Uh, not pictures and, and videos and stuff like that of doing rituals and ceremonies. I'm not into that. But just letting people know this is who I am and this is what I do. This is how I do my work. This is my approach. If you would like to join me in doing this activity or another activity, then be you know be you're welcome. And for some people, they just couldn't understand what that what that meant. But it's because they didn't understand that I'm a professional. I'm a human services professional. And so just like I would tell you what kind of a counselor I am or what kind of a psychologist I am or what kind of a lawyer I am or what kind of a dentist I am or what kind of a surgeon I am, I would tell you, you know, what kind of a priest I am. I'll tell you what kind of an educator I am. It's important for you to know who I am and how I work in order for you to make an intelligent decision about working with me. To me, it just makes sense because that's my background. That's what, I, that's what I've been trained in and that's what I've been, and been exposed to as a professional. But for some people, it's just like they, they could never let go of their own um, orientation uh, surrounding uh, Orisha lifestyle. And so one of the things that I've noticed is that that process, even though, you know, it it became personal for me just about 10 years ago. I remember even before then that there was there was like these these pivotal points in our history as a as a community wherein uh, we pretty much experienced these huge clashes between different branches of the Yoruba spiritual community. So in the 90s, late 90s, when the Internet really started to kick off, right? And, and we had Yahoo groups. Uh, people would get on the Yahoo groups and there would be these notorious flame wars that would go on for days, right? And people would just argue back and forth, back and forth, back and forth about the smallest details. They didn't quite know why they were <laughs> arguing about these details, but they just knew that people were saying things that they didn't understand or they were saying things in a way that they didn't like and they felt that they had to, you know, argue about it. They had to uphold their particular way of of um, doing things, right? And so, you know, I was a part of it. I, I, I really, I, I participated and I observed and I learned from the experience. Then later on, around, what, maybe 2008, 2010, you know, Facebook kicked off. And Facebook provided a, a whole other, you know, perspective on, on our practice. And um, it was it was a little better. I think Facebook is a little bit better than what was happening on the Yahoo groups. But um, certainly there are still some really like hot topics and, and just trigger topics that are guaranteed to kick off a flame war that might go for three or four days. Right. And people just argue back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There's no real per reason for it. It's, it isn't going anywhere. We aren't trying to accomplish anything particularly. It's just people with differing opinions who don't see any real, real reason to learn from one another. Okay? So the reason why I'm bringing this in, into the conversation right now is because um, leadership is about order. Leader, leadership is about vision. Leadership is about creating opportunities for, uh, for people who would otherwise either just, you know, collapse upon one another, fall upon one another, fight each other for, you know, just their little corner of resources or people who would just wander aimlessly and never really accomplish anything, right? And, and create some kind of a platform for all of these people to understand one another relative to a bigger picture that's that's what leadership does so right now we have we've been defining leadership by prominence and popularity oh if a person has in initiated more people then we call them a leader if a person is um uh 
more knowledgeable, then we consider that person a leader. Um, if a person is doing more ceremonies and things like that, we consider them a leader. Okay. And um, I don't think that's a legitimate criteria for leadership. That, that, that does demonstrate a certain level of, of expertise, which is important and admirable and necessary. But what we actually need is we need leadership. In order for us to progress and improve as a collective, we need leadership. So we need order. We need vision. And um, so what I want to do now is, is just contextualize some of the ways in which people can approach the practice. And, and, and not feel so compelled to insist that everybody does the same thing in the same way. So I want to give you an example, okay? Now, before I do, though, let me know, let you know that this is the School of Orisha Studies, and I'm your instructor, Obafemi Origunwa. And today I want to, I want to provide a, a sort of a multi-level um, uh, framework for understanding our practice. And so to do so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the example of, of auto mechanics, all right? Um, at the lowest level of auto mechanics, you can have a guy who works on cars, right? You know a guy who works on cars. Maybe, maybe he works on cars at the level that, you know, he just makes a mess. He's got, he's got, you know, uh, cars in front of the house, cars in the driveway, cars in the backyard where he's just pulling parts off of and, you know, just it's kind of wild. And you got maybe a guy who's 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 a hobbyist and he's got a 63 Mustang or a 1970 Riviera or a 1933 something. Right. And he's just always back there working on the car and, and, and just making it. Just cherry, everything, 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 just just cherry. The engine, the interior, the wheels, the paint, everything. Right? But he just works on cars. That's 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 pretty much it. This is it's a hobby. He has another job or another uh vocation, and working on cars is something for fun. Then you can have a guy who's a legitimate shade tree mechanic. What I mean by that is um he he will work on your car. You can bring him his your car and he'll fix it. He doesn't have any kind of license, no kind of insurance. He's he's not certified in anything. He just has grown up fixing cars and and he can pretty much fix anything. And so you bring him your car and if you don't need your car back within a week, he'll fix it and it won't, you know, you won't your car's not going to explode <laughs> or the wheel's not going to come off on the freeway. He's going to do a good job. He's just got to take his time. Shade tree mechanic. Um, then you can have up from that, you got a guy who has a garage. Okay, he's got a garage. And maybe he works there by himself. He Maybe he works there with an, another other guy or two. And, you know, he'll he's a step up from the shade tree mechanic. He'll probably get your car back to you within three days or so. Okay, he's got some certification, he's got a business license, he's got insurance. Okay, it's it's a business. Okay. Then slightly above that, you may have someone who um maybe has a factory certification. He's a Volvo certified mechanic. He's a Mercedes certified mechanic. He's an Audi certified mechanic. That means he's gone through the coursework and every year or every two years or whatever, he upgrades his training. So he's up to speed. He's got all the all the tools and, and the things necessary to fix, you know, Audis or Volvos or Mercedes or whatever. Right. But he's an independent operator and he just knows this particular uh, car or, 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 you know, all German cars or all, you know, uh, Japanese cars or something like that. Then you've got a mechanic who is a, a dealer mechanic. He works in the Toyota dealership. He works in the Audi dealership. And when you bring your car back, it's under warranty. Then this is someone who exclusively works within that, you know, dealership, that company. That's it. Right. These are different levels of the same thing. All of them are mechanics. All of them are mechanics, but they, they operate 
under different circumstances and with different expectations and with different levels of expertise and accountability. All right. A similar thing plays out within Orisha lifestyle. You've got guys who, you know, just work on spiritual stuff. You know, they just kind of dip and dabble. It's, there's nothing professional about it. There's no training it really involved. They just, for whatever reason, know to do little things. Okay? And they don't do it for other people. It's pretty much something that they do for themselves. Or it's a hobby. Okay? And then you can go all the way up. You got a, you know, shade tree person. This is someone, you know, maybe their parents, their mother or their father was a, a practitioner. And they grew up seeing certain things. And they can help you do certain things. They can they can walk you through a legitimate way to do a uh, a spiritual bath or to make an offering or something like that because they actually have expertise in doing it. They're just not certified. They're not even maybe not even initiated, but they know how to do this thing reliably and safely, right? But it, it's it still falls into the category of kind of being a hobby. Then you've got people who are. Professionals, they this is what they do. Okay, this legitimate, they've been trained, they've got a facility, they've got all of the standard materials and equipment and tools, and they know how to do specific things. They're certified to do certain things. Okay, and then you got people who are full on professionals. All right, they, they are not only skilled and they have you know time and experience under their belt, but they are they are part of a let's say they're part of a whole temple and there's 30 or 40 there's 10 or 15 other priests who who are part of this whole body and they they, they follow a, a specific standard and right there's a process that they go about doing there's all these are all different levels of the practice okay and so you as as someone who is a seeker you need to know who you're dealing with. If, if you're coming for services, you got to understand, does this person just work on cars or is this person a part of an established order and practice? You as someone who is aspiring to become a practitioner at some level or another, what's your intent? Do you want to be a part of, of, a, of a temple or do you want to be part of an established lineage where there's a there's a, a a methodology and there's a certification process and and you're and you're being trained in in exactly a, a particular method for accomplishing things or do you just want to learn enough to be able to take care of your spiritual needs and the spiritual needs of your family right very important distinctions for you to understand for yourself and and for you to be able to look at other people and as, assess who am I talking to Okay, what am I dealing with here? You know, and, and, and most importantly, what do I really want to accomplish? How do I want to carry out my work? Because, you know, the, the, the problem that we're facing is that the default amongst the, the professionals, that we who are the priests and the priestesses, is that everybody is going to be like a dealer mechanic, Right? That's why we're telling everybody you need to get initiated. Getting initiated is like the mechanic who has the the air drill and, and you can lift cars up off the ground. You got all the, the, the heavy artillery, right? That's that's you got everything to, to be able to work on cars full time, all day, every day. And you got a team of people who support you in that process. That that's what it means to be a priest or a priestess. OK, and you may or may not be interested in in doing all that. You just may want to solve your problem. And if, if that's what you're doing, you need to be real clear about that and not get distracted and, and kind of roped into doing something that that doesn't fit a your natural gifts and talents and your intentions for yourself. Maybe you're a lawyer or you're an accountant or or you're a salesperson. You, 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 you've got 25 years experience in what you do. You're not trying to stop what you're doing to dedicate the next 25 years to now becoming a a ritual specialist yeah you know what i'm saying because that's what it means this is not it's not casual if you're going to be a priest or a priestess it's not casual it's not a hobby it's not something that you do you know in your spare time 
Okay. So I just put this out there so that you can conceptualize what you're doing and you can conceptualize what other people are doing and then you can make really intelligent and informed decisions about what's best for you, what's best for your practice, what's going to help you to be most effective in helping to bring about the good condition for yourself and those who you're destined to serve. Aboraboye. Aboshishem.